Welcome to the Skull King Football Podcast, presented by Fox DFS Firelines. Now, here are your hosts, Justin and Ryan Skullrude. All right, hello, Skull King Nation. Welcome back to the Skull King Fantasy Football Podcast. My name is Ryan Skullrude. I am your host tonight. Tonight, uh, uh, I'm not going solo, even though the Justin is, is not here. We gave him the night off because it's his birthday. Uh, instead, we have a, a special guest with us, um, a staff writer for the quarterbacks on the Skull King football website. We have uh, Greg Talcott. Go ahead and say hi, Greg. Hi, everybody. Good to be uh, out of uh, print and, and on the camera. Glad to join you tonight. All right, and it's good to it's good to you know not have to do a solo show since Justin's not here. So I know that my voice isn't necessarily the the most enthralling and most exciting once we uh, once I get going. So uh, what a what a week it, it was this last week in fantasy football. The injuries piled up. We went over a lot of those in our last show. Um, there's a few more that we need to talk about and get involved with. So why don't we go ahead and get started with our news and notes. Uh, To start off, it looks like Jamal Charles has been moved to the IR. Um, I know that, Greg, you and I were talking about this earlier, and we're both to the point where people just need to stop drafting Jamal Charles. The guy's knees cannot hold up anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I don't – I think that was clear uh, well before this season, and and still you saw him going reasonably high in drafts based on this – uh, potential upside promise that we really haven't seen. I mean, uh, he certainly is is phenomenal when he has been healthy, but the problem is that it has been you know few and far between in the last few years. It's definitely time to move on. Yeah, I mean the guys, the guys. It's 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 weird to call people that are still two to three years younger than me over the hill in football years, but uh, I think I think this is this is pretty much it for Jamal Charles, especially in Kansas City. I think absolutely. I mean, it's probably, you know, he might not necessarily hang it up. Maybe he gives it one more go. I don't necessarily think it leads to anything productive. But like we were saying before the show, when you're when you're built to be a, a point guard in the NBA, you shouldn't be carrying the rock in the NFL. Yeah. So, all right, moving on. Uh, next bit of note, next bit of news. Um, Derek Henry, uh, we're talking about in, in Tennessee. Derek, they're saying that Derek Henry could see – a big workload again this next week. Uh, he came in and and actually got quite a bit of work this last week against. I was was it Jacksonville the the, the ugly color rush game where both those <laughs> both those uniforms you had the the kind of the the poop gold of, oh of Jacksonville and the and the powder blue of Tennessee. Um, Demarco went out for a little bit with a toe with a toe issue. He's had a clear um, his MRI was clear. Um, but has been practicing only limited uh, this week. Um, I want to say who's ten- who's Tennessee going up against this week? How did I miss that? Let me grab your schedule right here. And, um, we're prof- see, yeah. we're, we're professional. We we got all that laid out right ahead of time. Exactly. Uh, they're they're actually on the road at San Diego. Oh, beautiful matchup this week, and yeah, so I think that that looks that looks pretty favorable right there. I mean, San Diego is is certainly no no world beater defense by uh, any stretch of the imagination. I mean, against the run, they are top 10. Uh, They're exactly number 10 in the league. They give up uh, basically 86 yards a game on the ground. Uh, But I think uh, Tennessee certainly has a potentially a better rushing offense than than San Diego's faced on average this year. I think Derrick Henry, uh, when given the chance, has looked promising. Uh, it certainly would be a, a great value play, I think, relatively this week. Yeah, I've got. I think I've got a couple leagues where I don't have much of a choice due to bye weeks and injuries and guys just playing falling out flat on their faces. I've got one league I have no choice but to start Derrick Henry, um, and it's very encouraging to see that he will most likely get a better, a bigger workload this next week. Yeah. Um, going, uh, staying in that game, actually. Uh, Tyrell Williams um, expects to play against Denver. Um, we it didn't look like he was actually injured in the game, but was kind. Of, this was kind of a um, after um, after the game was over, kind of in practices the last couple days. He's had a little bit of a knee issue, um, but Tyrell Williams is expecting to play. While on the other side, Travis Benjamin um, looks like he actually has what what they're calling a grade two PCL sprain. They're saying that surgery is not needed, 
but um, you know that it's it's going to take rest for him in order to get well. Uh, it looked like he did not practice today. So I, do you think if if he's out? I mean, if Tyrell Tyrell Williams is expecting to play, so at this point you put him in your lineup if you've got him and need the wide receiver. Um, but with with Travis Benjamin looking like he's probably not going to play, would you be okay using Dontrell Inman if you needed, uh, say, a, a flex spot to use him? I think so. I mean, I think it, when you get to that point, you're probably uh, in the thin, the thin zones of rosters, um, and, and you're really – uh, maybe splitting hairs, you know, between, you know, what your options are. And I don't think it's something ultimately you, you want to lose too much sleep over. But, you know, it's it's a good play in the pitch. Okay. Um, going on to, let's go to the uh, Indianapolis and Green Bay. Uh, T.Y. Hilton has been reluctant to commit to whether or not he'll actually play uh, in the game against Green Bay. He's, I want to say he's also had a knee issue. So with him, with him sitting, with him, it looks like he may even he may sit in this game. Dante Moncrief had a pretty good game coming off this last week, uh, coming off injury with the uh, the broken shoulder blade that he suffered against Denver in week two. Um, was four catches, forty eight yards, and a TD. I think that Moncrief is in for, especially if Hilton sits. Moncrief could be in for a huge game um, simply because when he is in with um, with uh, Andrew Luck healthy, including last year. Last year in seven games with Andrew Luck, he finished with five touchdowns. I mean, he Luck looks for Moncrief because of his size compared to everyone else on the field. He's basically a tight end. Um, he has the body to be a good target in the red zone. And I think that he could he could be in for a decent game um, this next week. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think his targets are going to be uh, through the roof. I mean, when you're going against Green Bay, you're certainly not going to beat them. Um, on the ground. I mean, the Colts don't have a vaunted rushing defense or offense coming into this game, um, and it, it's certainly not going to be any better. Now, Green Bay does have a solid pass defense overall, but I think they have shown where they, where they are vulnerable, and I think Moncrief's a, a great play this week. Okay. Um, moving on to Ben Roethlisberger, or as my brother liked to call him in the beginning of the year, Ben Rascal Scooter, because he always seems to be injured when, you know, hobbling with his knees. Um, it looked like he was limited in practice today, well, being Wednesday. Um, it looks like they're going to go ahead and try to get him to start in this game against Baltimore. I personally, in the game is in Baltimore. I have an issue th even thinking about starting Ben Roethlisberger away from Pittsburgh. Um, and especially with the knee issues, I think this lines up more as a big game for Le'Veon Bell than it does necessarily for any of the receivers or for Big Ben himself. Um, yeah, I agree with you completely. I mean, you know, certainly coming back from injury, uh, he does not have memorable games on, on the road in Baltimore uh, historically. Uh, and so I would not look for this to be uh, a great game for him. I mean, I'm, I'm generally not one who likes to, to sit Big Ben just because he does – have the those massive games, right? I mean, the last thing you ever want to have uh, is a fantasy owner, and it's happened to me, although not a lot, is is to look down on that bench and see a guy with you know five touchdowns and you know 400 yards passing uh, because you try to make a, a smart play. But I, I don't think it looks great for him this week. I mean, I think he's a mediocre start uh, at best. Okay. Um, it looks like Odell is is getting healthier. He says he's at about eighty five percent, which, you know, I think Odell at eighty five percent is still better than a lot of the receivers in this league at a hundred percent. So, I don't think. I mean, for me, I'm not going to sit him if I've got him. No, I don't think you can possibly sit people when you take them that high in the draft. And he he still is he is playing, you know, relatively better now. He's 85% physical, and he's he's always about 35% mental. So if you're that. going into uh, any given matchup with with some potential issues. Now that combined with the fact that it's a it's a division game, it's the Eagles. This is a a bitter bitter rivalry, and even though I think he's he's by far more talented than any corner that he's going to go up against uh, on on Philly's side. Um, you know, you do have those those potential for for blowups with him you know, now and again, but absolutely, you, you have to start the guy. You have to go with him, even if he is a, 
um, a possible head in for you at the end of the end of the day. Some weeks. Yeah. All right. Uh, going on, Jaquiz Rogers going to the Thursday night game. Jaquiz Rogers has been ruled out for Thursday night football. And so as far as the Tampa Bay running backs go, it's just been a whirlwind. I, I was one of those guys that drafted Charles Sims knowing that I knew that Doug Martin was going to miss a whole bunch of time this year. He was going to get injured. He was no longer a contract year. He was going to get hurt. So I got Charles Sims in his first full game, second full game with Doug Martin out, and he gets injured. So I picked up Jaquiz Rogers. And after two full games of full use, He's injured. Right. So now at this point, we're looking at Peyton Barber and Anton Smith. I mean, neither one of these are world beaters, but if you are absolutely desperate for a running back, which I know a lot of people are, I mean, like I was telling you, uh, Greg, before the show, when I do my Q&A on uh, Vox DFS every Wednesday, one of the questions was, I, don't ha- I have no one to play I've got bye weeks. I've got injuries. Is there anyone who could even get me just two points in a standard league, just 20 yards to score something? And for me, in this game, if I had to pick between these two, I'd probably go with Anton Smith, um, given his history. Uh, I want to say a couple of years ago, he has the ability to be explosive. Um, a couple of years ago, he had, I want to say, three uh, games in a row with you know a 50 plus yard touchdown out of the backfield. So for me, it, it's Anton Smith. If I had to pick between the two, I, you know, I, if you want to give your thoughts. No, I, I I agree with you completely. I mean, I think the the Tampa Bay backfield has, has been an absolute disaster, and it reminds me of my own fantasy team uh, this year, where literally this week I think I'm starting like my ninth and tenth running backs. I mean, guys I wouldn't have even. I read about in the preseason, um, so it's it's. I feel for for the Buccaneers when when something like that <laughs> certainly happens, uh, because what are you going to do? But uh, Anton Smith at least does have a little bit more history to point to as far as having that one home run, you know, type of potential that you could see exposed in the game. I mean, Atlanta uh, ranked 13th overall in, in rushing defense, giving up a little under 100 yards. Uh, you know, on the ground, but they haven't given up seven touchdowns. Um, and so that's right around kind of middle of the league uh, it, it, as far as that's concerned. So I think Smith is, is definitely the play against him. Yeah, and one thing about, I think, for me, in, in looking at the the Atlanta defense, I, I, I want to say part of the reason that they've given up a little less on the running side is because of how many explosive plays they've given up in the passing game where some teams haven't needed to run against them. They just threw against them. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great point. I mean, they're, um, you know, it's like sitting ducks out there when you're, when you're throwing against Atlanta, they tend to get involved in shootouts and, and teams will abandon run, the run for, for other reasons. So they are definitely, definitely vulnerable to big plays. Yeah. Way to look at it. And one, and one more thing to put on there. They did face Green Bay last week who had no running game and had to throw the ball all over the place because they have no running backs. Yeah, so you do have you do have a variable in there that's that's skewing the stats stats a little bit lower. So you know they could be down a little bit closer to middle of the pack, you know, relatively speaking, down around you know, where Chicago and Tampa Bay are actually residing. Actually, New England's down there as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, going to moving to the Browns. Uh, Cody Kessler. They've the Browns have said that Cody Kessler will start against Dallas if he clears concussion protocol. For me, that I, that's better for the Browns than it is for fantasy players because um, the Browns, I mean, let's be honest, the Browns are horrible. They're looking at the number one pick again this next year. Um, and so with, with them, they need to see what they have in Cody Kessler. I think they may be drafting another quarterback depending on who's available in the draft at number one this year um, because I don't think that Cody Kessler will be the answer for them. Um, for me, I, it's a bit of a downer. I think Josh McCown is the better start for fantasy purposes. One, I think that he could help them actually get a win um, because he has the arm. Um, And plus, I think it's better. I think McCown would be better for both Pryor and uh, and Corey Coleman, um, who we'll be mentioning here in just a couple minutes. Um, I think that, you know, for me, McCown is the better fantasy guy, but I can see why the Browns would be going Kessler in this game. 
Yeah, I mean, it's really only in the realm of, of fantasy football that Cody Kessler deserves to be talked about or really any player on Cleveland for that matter. And they should be drafting quarterbacks both this year and every year after based on the experience that they've had. I mean, this is a team that has not had a quarterback uh, of, of any legitimacy whatsoever since Bernie Kosar. Um, and, and that is going, you know, way back in the day. You have to be playing Tecmo Bowl or some some game of that ilk to actually legitimately play with him because I believe he, he predates Madden in, in, in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, Cleveland uh, – and, and Dallas is no pushover on defense, you know, either. I mean, Dallas is a solid defense overall. Uh, they're ranked ninth. Uh, and I think uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. McCown definitely gives him the best chance to play. He's got a he's got a big arm. We've seen what he can do at times. Uh, he has his his flashes of brilliance, which is simply why he stays in this league despite being a a guy who really overall for his career, you know, he's he's an average quarterback, but he has these these moments of of greatness, and certainly he has the arm to make Pryor uh, a much a much more valuable weapon. Uh, but yeah, Kessler. You know, long term for the Browns, they they need to to look at him because you know McCown really should be just the backup. He he's nothing, no matter how good he plays. You're never going to build your team around him. Correct. Um, I actually heard an interesting stat uh, on another podcast that the average depth of target for Terrell Pryor uh, in this in the this last game was 19 yards. Oh my gosh. And so, I mean, you, but you have McCown who's got the, who has a big arm, so they can do that. Yeah. Where, where, where they compared that to Devontae Adams who this last week because he, he was kind of their, their scat back slash, uh, slash uh, uh, just kind of flanker guy. He, I think his average depth of target was four yards. <laughs> so, um, well, they, and, well, Green, Green Bay aside, I mean, because they – they this year their their yards you know per attempt are are woefully low compared to where they've been. It, it reminds you a lot of last year they still don't have a big play going, um, and yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting dynamic there. But Pryor, I think um, the one thing you can say about him is you really have to tip your cap to a guy who's transformed himself like that to come in. He got a lot of little preseason hype here about his abilities coming into this year. He's playing with absolutely nothing around him. Uh, and he's he's an exciting player, so it'd be nice to actually see him with a talented arm to play with here and there. I have him in my starting lineup in like three different leagues as my as my wide receiver four slash flex. Yeah, I think you got to. I mean, the home run potential there is just is just absolutely huge, and he's not going to goose egg you for the most part. Yeah, is and 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 let's let's me he's a, a a great comparison that I saw is um, you know. Terrell Pryor was willing to change from being a quarterback to working at becoming a wide receiver. And he's still making money and, and turning himself, let's be honest, starting to turn himself into a bit of a star in the NFL where Tim Tebow was not willing to change to become a different position. And now he's you know getting injured trying to create a, 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 a career in baseball, in minor league baseball. So... <laughs> Well, it's good that we can get a Tebow reference in still in in fantasy football these days, and that's it is it is ironic that Tim was willing to change positions only if it's a completely different sport. Yeah. So, all right, and then one one more thing, like I said, we were going to mention real quick. Uh, Corey Coleman looks like he is actually back and practicing, uh, fully uh, fully healed from the broken was a broken hand uh, that he suffered in practice. So I think that would actually you know even though it's Cody Kessler, if it's you know. If Kessler's not through concussion protocol, and it's McCown throwing the ball. I think that can create an interesting dynamic uh, between Corey Coleman and Terrell Pryor, both on the outside going up against Dallas. Now, again, like you said, Dallas is not a slouch of a defense. Right. Um, I want to say, let's see, in terms of pass defense, they are – They're number 14. On yeah, the they're, they're in the middle – yeah, about the middle of the yeah. pack, so – yeah, middle of the road. Um, yeah, so they're they're a solid, solid, balanced uh, defense there. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, everything looks a little bit better for Cleveland fantasy wise if McCown's in there. But yeah. really, anytime you're looking to Cleveland for solutions, I'm guessing your record isn't very good. 
<laughs> Correct. All right. Uh, uh, we've got a few more on here. Carlos Hyde is back practicing uh, with the, the shoulder injury. Um, he was another one of those guys that I was saying at the beginning of the year because of one, because of the, the division that he plays in playing in the NFC West where we, you know, the, you can see the punishing defense that Arizona has that Seattle has had, especially against the run. Um, and then with what we thought the, the Rams were going to have, but they've kind of been back and forth all year with injuries on their defensive line. I mean, the guys that he had to go up against, you didn't, it, and, and his injury history, you weren't expecting Carlos Hyde to make it very far through the season before he started having some injury issues and missing a whole bunch of games. Um, it looks like he is now back at least practicing in a limited, on a limited basis. Do you think he would be, do you think he makes it back for this game? Or you look, or are you thinking that you know just avoid that whole backfield altogether in San Francisco? Yeah, I, I think for the most part, even if he comes back in this game, um, San Francisco is going to get absolutely pasted, absolutely pasted by New Orleans. Um, San Francisco's defense is is just downright terrible, and I think it's you know it, it's approaching I think historically awful. Uh, when it comes to rushing defense uh, and, and what they're giving up. And so New Orleans is going to be able to run the ball uh, better than they usually do. Uh, and I think overall, they're, they're going to be running up the score. And I, I think even if Hyde does come back, his opportunities are going to be are going to be relatively limited this week. So I think there's enough reason to try to avoid uh, that situation, if at all possible. And, you know, if, if you're desperate, sure, go ahead and play him. But you really can't expect much. I mean, you're you're looking at best and hoping for a short yardage touchdown out of him to make it a worthwhile play. And outside of that, yardage wise, I can't see him doing a whole heck of a lot just because they're going to be down by so much. Yeah, and and even we, we even looked at. I mean, there's even some news uh, that I saw uh, a little bit earlier that there uh, the San Francisco coaches have actually stated that. Dewan Harris is doing well enough that they want to get him more carries. I mean, that's how bad it is for the San Francisco running backs that Dewan Harris is looking at getting more work. So. Yeah, I mean that is that's where it's, it's getting incredibly thin. And uh, you know, Carlos Hyde is is one of those those guys again where you know full of promise and uh, you know hella short on on, on delivery. Um, so. Any any time you put that a guy with that reputation in your lineup, you know you're you're doing it at the peril of your entire roster. Yeah. Uh, moving on, uh, let's go. There's a, a couple things to talk about in Kansas City. Spencer Ware is still in concussion protocol, and boy did he hurt me last week. Mm. Um, not only in not only on my season long leagues, but in some some daily lineups that I put together. Spencer Ware was a great value and short because you know short on delivery again because of you know getting hurt and getting the getting the concussion. If he is not um, available, are you how confident are you that Trekandrick West will be a a solid um, you know maybe running back to or flex play this week against uh, I want to say Jacksonville. Yeah, I mean I, I would say relatively speaking to the last matchup we were talking about with Carlos Hyde, I'd rather take West. Um, honestly, going into this game, uh, you know he is—he's playing at home. He's not playing against an offense that's going to going to run Kansas City off the, the field by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and, and within his role in the offense, I think he has more all, overall opportunity in a game like this uh, than you would have relative to Hyde. Well, and I think another thing that helps him is moving on to this next spot that that Nick Foles has been named the starting quarterback already uh, for Kansas City. Um, and if Nick Foles is your starting quarterback, you're going to be leaning on the running game. So um, you're going to be leaning on on who, whether it's Spencer Ware or Trey Kanner West. I'm, I mean, I know that Kansas City is going to take it as easy as they can with Spencer Ware to hopefully get him ready to be able to play on Sunday. And if he plays, I still think that Spencer Ware is the guy to go with. Um, however, if he misses, Trey Kanner West is – should get a huge workload, whether it be running the ball or because Nick Foles is the quarterback, getting those dump off passes out of the backfield like Spencer Ware was getting from Alex Smith. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, if, if he's able to go, uh, that's the way you, you want to lean. Um, I don't think they're going to run him out there and say he's good to go and then give him 
uh, you know, less than half of the touches overall. So I think the balance is, is to go with where if, if he gets the chance. But I think either way, whoever's declared uh, the guy who's going to be carrying the, carrying the ball uh, come Sunday uh, is a relatively decent player, especially in the flex position. Yeah. All right. Um, no, it looks like we missed a, a note from the Green Bay game. Ty Montgomery was limited in practice Wednesday as well as Jordy Nelson. Um, and I, if, if I remember right, actually looking at this, um, Randall Cobb has been limited in practice also and is questionable. At this point, it looks like Cobb most likely is going to play. Um, and we know that Ty Montgomery missed this last game. Um, that that was that was so unexpected because they just said that he was out with an illness but didn't say what illness it was. And then you come to find out it has to do with his sickle cell trait that he's having, you know, some leg cramps and some kidney issues. Right. And so it just kind of, you know, blew everyone's lineups out of the water. Um, you know, to me, I think, you know, usually with – who was it? It was John – when John Brown, when they realized that John Brown had this, they uh, – I think he only sat out one week and they were able to kind of work some things uh, – into his system to kind of help him be able to play the next week against Carolina. Um, Ty Montgomery at this point missing last week. Gee, I mean, if he's already practicing again because he was missing practices last week, if he's practicing again, I would guess that he's going to be available to play in the game against uh, Indianapolis. I would think so. I mean, if he's able to practice, I think things are, are looking encouraging, um, you know, for this week. And certainly he is, He's proven to be a much more valuable weapon, especially in fantasy once they made him eligible as, you know, as a running back uh, and your ability to carry him in these leagues. Uh, because, I mean, I think as a standalone, as a wide receiver, then it's just all it's in. It's a crap shoot. Uh, with as much as Rodgers spreads the ball around, um, I think you can generally do better than that. But because of the running back situation and because of his ability to play in the backfield, I think more adeptly than anybody else they've ever had, or anybody else they've had, I'm sorry, this season, not ever, but since the injuries began, I mean, when you, you, you trade for Nile Davis and, you know, you, you cut the guy off of a, you know, after a cup of coffee, uh, that was <laughs> – Nile Davis is another guy that was already on my roster this week and this, uh, this season. So that's how pathetic my backfield is. But I think Montgomery, uh, you know, could be, could be a decent play certainly if he's, if he's out there. I think Green Bay is the favorite in that game. Um, I think Rodgers is looking better overall. Uh, you know, over the course of the last couple of games, maybe things are starting to click and come around a little bit. Um, so I think he'd, he'd be a solid play if it looks like he's going to be healthy. And you have enough time to make that decision to start. Into it. Yeah. Well, uh, getting back to Niall Davis real quick, uh, he actually knew the cup of coffee was that he was with the New York Jets because they signed him and then released him the next day when they signed C.J. Spiller. Yeah, that's even a little shorter cup of coffee. <laughs> that's not even a, like you ordered your coffee – but you got an emergency phone call and you had to leave before you could drink it, but you still, you still paid a tip. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think um, Belichick was there. <laughs> 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 I resigned as HC of the NYJ. All right. Um, and then a couple more big things. Norv Turner has resigned as the offensive coordinator in Minnesota. This is not surprising considering how horrible the, Offense has performed in Minnesota since basically like week one or week two. They had a couple of decent, um, efficient games, but since then it's been god awful. Thanks to, I mean, really, let's be honest, probably thanks to Sam Bradford. Yeah, I mean, I think Minnesota, the only thing that we saw on offense because of the injury, I mean, Peterson started the season horribly, then he got injured. And I think in seeing Minnesota win, what we saw was our own surprise that they could do so with that roster as it is. Um, there's not a ton of – obviously, there's no backfield talent. Sam Bradford is, is I think, a more than serviceable quarterback. I mean, I think he's a pretty solid quarterback who could probably get a, a good team to the playoffs. But that good team can't solely exist on, on defense. And, sorry, but North Turner, again – He's one of these guys where he constantly touted for, like, their offensive abilities. And, like, you, where are you going to point to the success? I mean, are we going back to the Cowboys with Aikman and Emmett Smith? Is, is the time that he's going to highlight what he accomplished? Because, I mean, for Pete's sake, anybody could have produced something, you know, as the, as the OC for, for that team. I mean, any place he's gone, the offense is terrible. 
I mean, only I think Mark Tressman is worse because Mark Tressman is is the worst offensive coordinator in the history of football or football-related sports, including rugby. Um, and I think next to him, uh, Mike Martz is the second most overrated. And next to that, next to Mike Martz and, and Tressman, you have to have Norv Turner. The guy is absolutely awful. It could go nowhere but up from here from Minnesota. <laughs> Well, I mean, and let's look back at a couple of plays that, that North Turner has been. He went to being a head coach at San Diego. That didn't last long. No. Um, he was an offensive coordinator. I mean, his, the, one, the one positive that I can put to North Turner wasn't really him. It was, it was uh, when he was in Cleveland and Josh Gordon went off to be the, you know, the number one fantasy wide receiver. But that had nothing to do with him because if you look at the quarterbacks – it wasn't the offensive scheme. It was the fact that no one could keep up with Josh Gordon, mm -hmm. um, you know, probably because he was on cocaine and being able to, you know, easily able to outrun everyone. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's the most success that I can, that I can think of in all my years thinking back on, on football that North Turner's really been able to quote unquote point to right. over the last 10. So, yeah, I mean, I think the guy's track record is just absolutely atrocious. I think if you're a football fan and you hear that Norv Turner is being brought on board, you should be really, really upset. It's like, you know, we're going to bring in Romeo Cornell to fix this. <laughs> you know, I was the defensive coordinator under Belichick. It's like, so you were in charge of his dry cleaning and what else? I mean, do you actually get Hoodie's dry cleaned or was he in charge of cutting off the sleeves? Because that is, I mean, you're talking about the bottom of the coaching carousel at that point. Yeah, pre pretty much at that point. Um, all right. Uh, I have a thing on here about the New Orleans running backs, but I think we may actually save that until the start, some of the start sit stuff, just because that, that kind of more goes that direction. So. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't we go ahead? We'll move on to our DFS section. Before we get started, I'll go ahead and do our little uh, endorsement advertisement. Uh, get that going, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of dig into some uh, some DFS plays for this week. All right. So our our daily um, our our daily fantasy uh, platform of choice is Yahoo Daily. They are the industry leader in fair play for DFS platforms. They make it easier for the little guy like you and me to be able to compete in daily fantasy contests uh, with some of the major fair play rules that they have. That they have. Uh, for starters, they limit entries to a maximum of 10 per user per contest. So when you have those major um, huge contests where there's like 17 to 20,000 people allowed into this contest, Yahoo limits your amount of entries to 10, where if you're on one of the other big sites like FanDuel or DraftKings, you can only, um, you, you have uh, professionals putting in 100 to 150 um, uh, lineups into these contests. You, it's hard to compete with that. So when you have a maximum of 10 per contest, it makes it a lot easier. There's the, it spreads out the, the possibility uh, of, uh, of other winners as, and uh, going on with that, they also have a provision where you cannot have more than 1% of the total entries in a contest. So if there's only 200 people allowed in, an, in, a, in a contest, you can only have two entries. So again, they're, they're maximizing the ability for you to, to keep the, the playing field level uh, when you're playing your, your daily fantasy contests. Um, they identify veteran players with a badge so you know who you're going up against. You know that if you have a whole bunch of veteran players, you're maybe a beginner. They have beginner contests for you to enter. Um, and then also they eliminate and prohibited scripting tools to upload lineups or entries, uh, which I know that uh, the big websites, they, they'll have, um, there's, there's software that you can use to actually upload 50 lineups into a contest. Yahoo Daily has gotten rid of that. So if you want to play Daily Fantasy and you don't want to worry about playing against the pros, um, or you know who have thousands of entries in a contest, uh, create an account and start playing on Yahoo Daily Fantasy. Um, you can actually get onto Yahoo Daily um, and create your account through Skull King. Go to skullkingfootball.com slash Yahoo Daily. That's one word, Yahoo Daily. And right now we actually have a little thing going where if you actually go on to um, uh, Yahoo Daily through Skull King Football, create a new account and enter into a con enter enter into a paid contest send us a screenshot of your paid contest entry email it to me 
Um, there's, you know, the, all the information is there. We will actually give you a free premium membership to Skull King Football. So make sure to get on there, get onto Yahoo, sign up for Daily Fantasy, um, and you can get involved with uh, a premium membership on Skull King Football to get all of our premium rankings, our, uh, our projections, uh, week by week, pl- uh, position by position. And so, uh, yeah, so again, go to skullkingfootball.com slash Yahoo Daily to get involved with that. All right, into our daily fantasy notes. Now, let's be honest. You, Greg, you and I are at a little bit of a disadvantage when it comes to daily fantasy because both of us happen to live in states that outlaw daily fantasy. However, um, that doesn't mean that we can't give you, um, you know, some good advice on how to, on, on guys that are going to be solid picks. Because let's be honest, the, you can find solid picks, but it's a matter of in daily, you have a budget that you have to work with. And so what we're, what we're looking at is we're going to, we want to give you maybe a, a, you know, whether it's a, a guy that's, you know, a high price or low price that we absolutely love. And then a value play that if you have a couple of, you know, high price wide receivers, you think are going to go off this week, you need a low price running back or a low price quarterback to kind of mix in there. That's, that's kind of what we want to be able to do for you. So um, again, it's more like, I guess you can kind of think of it as, um, for us picking the players, it's kind of like how we would pick, a, you know, a start sit kind of a kind of a, a, a position. So here we go. Let's go ahead and get into this with quarterbacks. I have kind of my my big list, but if we want to go ahead, um, in terms of quarterbacks, if you had one to pick, um, Greg, who would it be to start this week? If I had one to pick, and I'm, I'm willing to spend the money, I again I'm going to lean towards Drew Brees this week with just. Uh, you know, a favorable matchup against a team he's seen uh, many times uh, at, at this point with the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, again, a very beatable defense. Their, uh, their defense is incredibly susceptible against the run and giving up 185 yards, I think, per game um, on, on the ground. Like, when I actually pulled that up, um, it, was, it was something I had to repeatedly look at over and over again. Uh, to see if it, I was actually seeing it right. But that's actually the case. We're giving up five, over five yards of carry. Um, and so I think that's going to open things up for, for Drew Brees, and he should be able to put up, you know, one of his, you know, at least an average Drew Brees week, which an average Drew Brees week, week is, is good enough to be one of the top two quarterbacks in fantasy basically every single season. So to me, it seems like a safe bet. I mean, if I'm looking at Yahoo!, Daily fantasies at thirty nine dollars. That's a lot of money, but that's who I would have built my roster around. Uh, certainly this week in, in in daily fantasy. Yeah, for me, I'm only. I mean, I'm only going a buck cheaper. Uh, you know, if there's a it, what I would consider a, a must start, it's got to be Aaron Rodgers. Like you, you know, like you alluded to, he has been um, getting more and more in sync in terms of throwing the ball. Part of that is probably because he's had to throw the ball, you know, almost 60 times a game because they have no running backs. And so the, it's basically he's, he's throwing the ball like crazy. He does have uh, a little bit better of a matchup. He's going up against uh, Indianapolis. Let's see their pass yards per game that they're giving up. Indy, where are they? They're, yeah, they're giving up 200, 287 pass yards per game. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're 31st in the league. I mean, they've given up, uh, you know, 14 passing touchdowns. They've only picked the ball off twice. Uh, a QB rating of 103. I mean, you, you have a couple of teams in the league that are actually equal to or, or worse than that. Um, so that's that's pretty pretty darn bad. I mean, I think absolutely that is a, that's a great play there for, you know, for a, a dollar difference. Um, I think either one of those guys – you're going to get your money's worth. And that's what's the most important thing when you're talking about paying, you know, 39, 38 bucks for a player. The most important thing is that you get a return on that investment. Correct. You know, you can't have a below average week. And I don't think either one of those guys looks below average that week, you know, relative to spending a 36 on a Cam Newton on the road in LA, where he's likely to get teed off on again. And then they need to have a press conference about how things are unfair. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If you had to pick maybe maybe a, a value play, you know, it's you know, at this point, uh I'm I'm looking at a value play maybe thirty two dollars and below, um, in terms of a quarterback. 
um, you know, kind of in that average, av- you know, 30 to $32 is about the average for a, a starting quarterback. You know, is, is there a guy that's really, you know, jumping out to you that could really uh, have a great game this week? I mean, I don't want to say great game. And again, they haven't necessarily been awesome. I mean, I thought for me, the Giants were the team to beat, um, or at least one of the you know, probably top three at minimum in the NFC this year. And I think they're still kind of in that talk, uh, but they, they haven't played as well as I would like. That being said, I think if you're looking at $26, Eli Manning, that's a pretty good bet right there. A division game at home, um, you know, I think Manning can certainly put up points against Philadelphia. Uh, and I, I would expect to have a, a reasonably good game coming out of it. All right. Uh, for me, I, mean, I, I agree with you there. The, Eli Manning is kind of back and forth, but he, he, because of the weapons that he has, he has the potential to put up that big game, to put up you know the 300 yards and three TDs. You know, he may throw a couple interceptions in there too, but again, he has that potential to put up the big numbers. Um, for me, I mean, I'm actually going. I'm going to go a little bit more spending. I'm actually going. I like. I kind of like Dak Prescott at 31 bucks going up against Cleveland. Not only because can he, not only because he has, you know, Ezekiel Elliott, but it's catching dump off passes. He loves throwing to Cole Beasley over the middle. He has. It looks like uh, Des Bryant is healthy and back, at least with how he played this last game. Um, you know, it wasn't a, a great game for for Bryant in terms of um, how efficient it was. But, uh, you know, he's still piled up over 100 yards and, and a TD. So he's got the weapons to throw to, plus he has the ability to run it in himself. And I think, you know, I think that, that and against a, a, a non-existent Cleveland defense, it could, you know, could really, could really put it up for some, uh, a, a return on value. I think you're definitely right. I mean, I, you know, I think one of the single best stories – uh, in the NFL this year is the Dallas Cowboys, is Dak Prescott, um, and, and what that team's done. And he's gotten – he's been great since his first snap, but he's gotten better, I think, from a fantasy standpoint as weeks go on. And when you get to go against, uh, you know, the, the sisters of the, the poor and the needy, um, like Cleveland, then, you know, it's – I think it's a solid play. And one of these games, he will explode and, and put up some pretty big numbers. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to running backs. Um, let's go ahead and if you know, I mean, I'm sure it's probably pretty obvious, but if you had to, you know, pick a big a big name uh, or, or a high spend running back, who's it going to be? Right. Well, I mean, I think you look again, no, no further than you know, anybody who plays the Sisters of the Poor, the Blind, which is Dallas against Cleveland, and having to run. Uh, you know, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, you know, out there against him, uh, you have to go with it. I mean, he's been, you know, pretty much uh, about the most dominant back in the league, um, you know, this year. I put a caveat there because Jordan Howard hasn't played in every game this year. He's been pretty spectacular when he has played. But uh, I think Elliott is um, certainly the guy that you you ultimately want to go with uh, at that spot. Yeah, at seven games, he is averaging over 100 yards a game. And he had week one where they they were kind of they let's be honest in week one they limited him a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, he ended up with was it fifty one rush yards and and a TD, one reception for one yard. After that, the next the next week they gave him a little bit more eighty three yards a rush TD a couple receptions. Since then, a hundred and forty yards, two receptions twenty yards, one hundred and thirty eight yards a TD a reception for nineteen yards, one hundred and thirty four yards two rushing TDs. Three receptions for 37 yards, 157 against Green Bay at Green Bay with two receptions for 17 yards. And even this last week was a quote unquote down week for him. He only got 96 rush yards and four receptions for 52. The guy still had almost 150 total yards. So, I mean, the kid, you know, in the beginning of the season, I was, I was one of those guys that was wait on Ezekiel Elliott. Don't go out. I mean, I was one of those guys. If you want to draft him, go ahead and take that risk. I'm not going to take that first round risk with the rookie. You know, if he proves if he proves to be a uh, an absolute stud, awesome. I'm just that's that's a, a risk I'm not willing to take. A lot of people have, and it it's really paid off for him. So, absolutely. I mean, he's been um, he's been exceptional uh, to watch each each and every week. And I'm I'm with you. I mean, I was a little. 
little nervous coming in. I mean, the, the workload that he had coming out of, of Ohio State, um, you know, and, and how much they were going to need to lean on him here. Was he going to be able to do it? But it is a testament, one, to his ability, uh, and two, to the freakiness of that offensive line. I mean, when Dallas was Dallas back in the 90s with the original triplets, what doesn't get – mentioned is the quintuplets that blocked for the triplets which just absolutely destroyed you know every line in front of them week after week after week and you have the same I think buildings and that type of line that's developing here in Dallas from that level of dominance and these guys Dak Prescott and Elliot are going to produce because I will tell you something you can't go and throw those two guys behind the Browns offensive line and think that we're having the same conversation. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting watching uh, watching uh, Sunday Night Football and how when they do the introductions of the players, of the offensive and defensive players with the little pictures in the corner, and it actually has their pro football focus ranked for them at their position. Mm-hmm. And you look at the, the, the Dallas offensive line and only one of them is outside the top 15 at their position. <laughs> right. So, right. I mean, the, the line is, that line is built to succeed. Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. yeah, for me, I mean, Ezekiel Elliott is the obvious pick at $39. I mean, if you go down uh, just a couple bucks, Le'Veon Bell, like we were talking about earlier with, with Ben Roethlisberger coming back from an injury, um, I believe it was an actual, they actually did a little bit of a cleanup surgery on his knee. Coming back from that, he's not going to be all that mobile. They're going to have to get the ball out quick. I think Le'Veon Bell is in for a huge game. They're going to have to depend on him, whether it be dump offs out of the backfield or just plain running the ball. It's, it's, I think it's going to have to be Le'Veon Bell is going to be the key to success in that game against Baltimore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to look for him being a focus on, you know, give or take a a third, uh, approaching a third, um, you know, of offensive plays uh, in in the game. And so I think Bell's, uh, I think Bell's absolutely a a great play for, for a couple dollars cheaper. All right, and if you're looking for someone, you know, kind of a, a bit of a value, if you're looking right around that $20 range or maybe, you know, even go, you know, even if it's way lower, um, you know, do you have, do you have that guy that you're looking at that's, that you would want to want to look at? Well, I mean, I think, it, you know, we were talking about some of these names earlier, um, but realistically, you know, what, what's the New Orleans situation against San Francisco, how vulnerable that team is against the run, and have Tim Hightower in there at 14 bucks. I mean, depending on how you want to build your team this week, that's a pretty cheap play right there the way I see it. There are some other decent names that I think are down in that range where you have some upside potential that you can get without spending necessarily a ton, um, you know, on running backs this week. Yeah, I think, well, and if, if you look just one spot below Tim Hightower, again, at $14 is Derrick Henry. If mm-hmm. DeMarco Murray can't go – Derrick Henry is going to be the worker because they don't have a huge, let's be honest, Tennessee doesn't have a huge passing game. Right. It, it's pretty much, you know, Kendall Wright has kind of come out of the woodwork, you know, from his injury and been back and forth, had a good week, bad week, and a good week. Is this week going to be the bad week? <laughs> um, yeah. And then you've got, but then you've got, you've got Delaney Walker, who let's be honest is, you know, has only gotten better with age, has been, you know, has been basically the main target for, um, for Marcus Mariota the last couple of years. But other than that, they really don't have any um, extremely solid, dependable receivers. So really they have to depend on that downhill running game. And if, again, if DeMarco Murray is questionable or, or just, you know, ends up he can't go or they think he may be limited, I mean, 14 bucks for Derrick Henry, he should run all over that, that San Diego defense. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think so. If you made a backfield of those two guys for 28 bucks. Um, you know, it, it, it's pretty tough to, to beat, I think, that potential with, you know, paying a high-dollar starter and another uh, deep value pick right there. You may get more combined production from, you know, spending less than $30 on two players. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to wide receivers. Um, you know, you've got the, the usual big names at the top of the list. Um, you know, is there – you know, if you take, let's say you take out Julio Jones and Mike Evans, take those two off the top. Who are you looking at for, you know, a big, you know, a big name, big money play this week? Yeah, I think, 
what I'm looking for here, and again, yeah, it, it might be a little tilted one way, uh, but I think Brandon Cooks has has a decent chance right there. Thirty-two dollars is a little spending given he has been home run or strikeout. I would characterize basically his his season as so far. But again, San Francisco is just so bad. They're so bad on so many levels, and you know, a guy like Brandon Cooks is just one of those guys who. You know, he's going to have his moments, and, and, and they could just be absolutely, absolutely huge games. So if I'm looking for big dollars, I'm going there. I want to stay away personally from, you know, an Antonio Brown and, and Big Ben's, you know, game back against Baltimore on the road. I mean, I don't like that. We talked earlier maybe about Hilton. I mean, but I think of the really high-priced guys, I'm going to tend to lean that way. Yeah, um, I I like Jervis Landry at $2 less. The problem with Jervis Landry is playing in Miami looks like – as of right now, they're looking at a chance of scattered thunderstorms during that game, which could affect, um, which could affect the passing game. Which, if you if there's any adverse effect to an already bad passing game with Ryan Tannehill, that could cause problems for Jarvis Landry, even though he is the really the only target that that Tannehill can manage to throw the ball to. Um, other than that, yeah, you're looking at you know. I would actually go down a little bit farther and take Michael Thomas of New Orleans again against San Francisco right. at twenty six bucks because you know he's he's going to be another another great play. He's it looks like he's kind of taken over Willie really Sneed's spot. Yeah, it does look like he's stepped into that role. Sneed it, it has dropped off. Um, that's the thing that scares me about Landry this week is the potential for rain. I mean. I've seen enough games in my life where the torrential rains hit Miami, and those are some of absolutely these, the worst football games uh, any human being ever has to sit through, ever, uh, especially if you're relying on a quarterback-wide receiver uh, combo in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. And then moving down to, you know, again, our value plays, you know, moving down to, say, the $20 range, maybe a little bit lower. Um, you know, is there someone that, that you've kind of had your eye on looking through the list? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, if I'm looking this week, uh, I think Cole Beasley, uh, you know, is, is a solid play um, down there. I think the other one that I had, uh, actually, when I was looking at building out my my DFS team for this week, uh, was Golden Tate. Um, I think with, you know, there's, uh, unfortunately, Marvin Jones is one of these guys who's, who's showing up on the injury report um, you know, every single week, it's like, um, you know, a Cowboys player showing up on a weekend arrest report. Uh, it, it gets a little old to see at a point, but I think as a result of that, Golden Tate's going to stand to be a little bit more of a beneficiary there. And if you're looking at the difference that you're spending, you know, in that game between those two players, I think Tate looks, looks pretty reasonable. Yeah, I I think I think he would he would be a good play. I was you know for me going a little bit cheaper, going to like we were talking about with if T Y Hilton misses, Dante Moncrief could have a huge game against Green Bay at only sixteen dollars coming back off the injury. Um, I think that he could you know again like we said he is the only real big body for for Andrew Luck to throw to. And with the success that he has had, if you add in this year, he's had two games with Andrew Luck or three. Two of those three, he's gotten uh, he's gotten touchdowns, and the one that he didn't, he only had what one or two catches and got, had his his shoulder blade broken in like the you know end of the first quarter. So uh, you know they have they seem to have a good chemistry that could that, that could you know really help out your again. Dante Monker is only sixteen bucks, forty yards in a TD, or maybe if he just has like 70, 80 yards with a bunch of catches since it's half point PPR, that right there meets, meets your value. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, for, you know, probably the deal of the week uh, is to get Moncrief at, at $16, you know, especially if Hilton ends up sitting. Um, and even if he if he doesn't sit, he's still uh, going to have be an above average value relative to dollars spent at 16 bucks. Yeah. And then we didn't, oh, we didn't, I don't know why I missed this, but we didn't really talk about tight ends um, before the show. Um, is there maybe, you know, just maybe one tight end that you really like for this week? Uh, you know, as I, as I was going through the tight ends earlier, um, you know, I, I actually thought uh, that, that Eric Ebron looked like a decent play uh, this week overall. I think Minnesota versus tight ends isn't exactly necessarily their, their strong suit. Um, I think this type of game, the kind of passing that you're looking for, 
um, you know, and it, it's a traditional Detroit Minnesota matchup where these games tend to be fairly close. Uh, you're going to have maybe some swap on both sides of the ball, uh, but ultimately those things will, will level out. And I think Ebron's one of those guys where you have the potential for those red zone touchdowns and whatnot. He's a pretty cheap value down there at, at 16 bucks. Yeah, uh, for me, I'd I'd be willing to spend a little bit more going to twenty one dollars with Kyle Rudolph going up against Detroit. It's in Minnesota, and Detroit is the worst team against tight ends this year. Um, I think there's maybe been one game that they haven't given up a touchdown to a tight end, but they've had multiple games where they've given up more than one touchdown to a tight end. Um, if you look at the was it the first game of the season against the second game of the season when they played Indianapolis, I can't remember which one it was. Right, the Jack Doyle game. The Jack well, Jack Doyle had two touchdowns, and Dwayne Allen had one. So they gave up three touchdowns to tight ends in that game. Right. Plus one to Moncrief. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was a that was a disaster. That was a tight end field day. Um, that game. So yeah, absolutely. Rudolph is a. Uh, is a safe play there, and you're not you're not spending necessarily time depending on how you, you balance your team out right there. I you know, maybe you go a little bit heavier tight end and, and save money back into the defense. Yeah, and and with the you know at two hundred dollars for your budget, your average salary is twenty two dollars a player. That's under the average. I mean, only a little bit, but that's under the average. So I think that that going Kyle Rudolph right there is it would be a, a decent play. And then let's you know is there a a a, a defense that you really like for this week? The defense I really like, um, you know, I, I think you have to like uh, Dallas on the road, actually, at Cleveland. I think they're going to – they have a chance to play pretty well um, there at, at 18 bucks. I mean, so it's not necessarily a, a tremendous value. I would never – you know, in building out this roster, probably no matter how I cut it, I would never have enough money left over to probably touch anybody above $12, you know, just simply the way – that, uh, that I would build a team out. Uh, but I actually do – I do like Dallas this week. I, I do like that defense overall. I think Cleveland's always going to be a team that's prone to make mistakes, and teams that are prone to make mistakes can give up defensive touchdowns and the like. So as long as Dallas doesn't give up points on the other end, uh, which I think is, you know, is certainly possible. I mean, if you – if we look at overall what they're going to give up, um, you know, scoring-wise each week, I think Dallas is – is a decent play there. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with you. We, we, we pick on Dallas, or we pick on Cleveland so much on this show just because of how, and, and I'm not saying this show tonight, I'm saying all season. It's, I mean, because Cleveland is Cleveland. Right. The Browns, I mean, they, they just, they haven't been able to get anything going. You stream, you stream against Cleveland. Um, it's just, and it's, unfortunately, it's been like that for years now. Um, Kind of for me, looking, I'd be willing to take the Detroit Lions defense against the Minnesota offense, especially now that North Turner's gone. We don't know what their offense is going to look like. And, you know, I actually picked um, this last week Chicago's defense against Minnesota in a couple of my primetime lines, thinking that, you know, part of the reason was because all of my other lineups earlier in the day were so bad picking what should have been good plays and everyone got injured, I picked a completely contrarian line where I picked Jay Cutler to have a good game. I picked the Chicago, the Chicago uh, Bears defense to play well against Minnesota. And what do you know? It worked. <laughs> so, um, you know, Minnesota has been – their offense has been stagnant. And, again, this is why North Turner is stepping down. So do they – you know, is one week going to be enough for them to figure out some things to pick it up? And so I'd, I'd be willing to, you know, maybe have a dart throw if I don't have the budget, um, you know, to have a, a dart throw with the, with the Detroit Lions at $13. Yeah, I think that's that's a good call. I think, you know, if you knew you were going to get rain, I think the Jets are a good call against right. Miami. I mean, if you find out that that game is going to be an absolute disaster, run the Jets out there because, I mean – uh, Mother Nature is going to overrule any offense, especially if that offense is led by Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, but, but hey, you know they've got J.H. I running the ball two two games in a row with two hundred yards. You know that is one of those things where I mean, at the beginning of the you know J.H. I was the guy that they talked about coming into the year, then all of a sudden it switched to Arian Foster, which was almost that predictable play. It's like that. Okay, this is going to be the change of venue. Foster is going to have that one of these you know bounce back years. You know throws up some big numbers is kind of the 
the feel good story. The reality story was Arian Foster is Arian Foster and he's going to be a, a bone heap, you know, inside of two snaps of practice. Uh, but Ajay wasn't doing anything until these last couple of games where suddenly he thinks he's Red Grange. Um, I don't know that the same thing is going to happen uh, with the Jets or that he can he can maintain that. But I think there are some just some, some decent value plays this week. I mean, overall, in the, on the defensive side of the ball, I mean, you can see some, some games that you can go ahead and play and, and get some decent results without spending a lot of money. Yeah. All right. Um, that's it for the DFS section. Let's go ahead and move on just uh, the last little bit. Um, Justin and I usually play a little game called uh, Pick 'em and Stick 'em, where we go back and forth between players you know, that are owned in less than 50% of leagues. We're putting that on hold this week, and we'll get back to that with Justin and I next week. Uh, so tonight we're just going to finish off with some start and sit. Um, and we're going to start off with, uh, with this one. Um, I told you, Greg, about this question that I did in the, uh, in the Vox DFS uh, chat that I do, the Q&A that I do every week on Wednesdays with them. Um, this was since you are our quarterback writer. Um, if you had to pick between Blake Bortles against Kansas City, Eli against Philadelphia, or Tannehill against the Jets, which one are you taking? So, and yeah, this was a great question. And again, I go back to Eli. Now, there, Eli has got more than his – share of haters. I mean, there are a tremendous amount of Eli haters that are out there. But overall, look at what he did last year, right? About his best statistical year ever. Um, probably his best statistical year. And I think this year, not as good, but his potential in any given game is high. And I think those games tend to be at home. They tend to be, um, you know, when they count against game teams like Philadelphia, who, you know, solid defense, but beatable. And Eli has the weapons. Now, if we look on the other side of the ball or the other matchups, Jacksonville last week, halfway through, I'm sitting here watching the game, halfway through the fourth quarter, Blake Bortles has 150 yards and a touchdown. It's an absolute disaster like the rest of his season. And then all of a sudden the guy explodes like Jimmy Chitwood at the end of Hoosiers to, to throw up these amazing numbers and, and look great at the end of the game. But season wide, he still looks terrible. He's on the road at Kansas City, a notoriously difficult place to play. I don't really like him there. And that, and that brings us back to what we were just talking about uh, with some value on defense. I mean, you are looking at the potential of some not pleasant weather uh, in Miami. Tannehill needs uh, a Wizard of Oz type of special environment day to really produce anything anyway. I mean, if you start stacking the elements against him, you know, it's, it's not going to look good. So I don't think matchup-wise you would lean towards, you know, between conditions and talent. Uh, you would look at, at Bortles or Tannehill in that situation. I think the play there is Eli Manning. Um, he's not going to kill you. Uh, and he's got more upside than either of the other two, I would think, in those matchups. All right. Uh, going to running backs again. We we had one of the one of the guys on here. This was this was the actual question that he posted on on Vox. Let me let me scroll up here to find it. He goes, he goes. Are there any way under the radar plays at running back this week? I am in last place. I have lost my last four games. My team isn't terrible. I have the sixth highest points for, but I'm getting destroyed as my opponents seem to have their best week against me. I am last in terms of points against. <laughs> So he's had the most points scored against him so far this year. Um, he goes, he's had eight in, in a standard scoring league. He's had 802 points scored against him in eight weeks. So teams are averaging a hundred points against him in standard. Um, no one else is, everyone else is around 750 or less against them, against them. So he goes, anyway, a few of my options that no one has touched, uh, Bobby Rainey, Teron Ward, uh, Don Jackson, Alfred Morris, DeAndre Washington. A couple of the guys that I threw out there for him would be CJ Procise of Seattle. Um, again, he's, he said, he's, I'm struggling. Is there a guy, that, a warm body that could get me a point or two? And so for me, I told him uh, CJ Procise. I think that with, um, with Thomas Rawls still out, Procise, um, the Seahawks released CJ uh, Spiller, who was doing, who was, being serviceable as a third down back while Procise was out. Procise came in in the New Orleans game, 
healthy, had 101 yards, and yeah, he had the big play for 43, but still had 58 yards on his other, I want to say, five or six touches. So I think ProSize could be an okay play if the guy is, you know, if you're absolutely desperate and need a warm body to throw in there, ProSize could be one. And the other one that we talked about was Anton Smith of Tampa Bay, um, you know, just and his big play potential that he has shown in the past. Yeah, I think if you could grab, you know, either one of those, uh, you know, those are solid plays. And definitely, like, uh, you know, Pro Sice is a, is a Notre Dame homer over here. Uh, you know, I'm going to always lean to the, the Golden Domer as being the pick, which I may have given away earlier uh, with my Golden Tate suggestion. But, uh, you know, Alfred Morris, I mean, is out there. I mean, I think you know, he's, he's good if he ends up vulturing a short yardage touchdown. Otherwise, it might not happen. I think DeAndre Washington, you know, maybe marginally a little bit better chance as a guy, um, you know, relative to an Alfred Morris. But it's it's going to be slim pickings at this point, you know, on the running back wire uh, to try to get somebody who's going to get you anything. But when it comes to a point, you know, or a couple of points, you know, just something serviceable, you know, certainly, you know, the price processes of the world are, are going to more than meet that need if you're out there. And even Alfred Moore should be able to, to probably materialize something uh, along those lines. Um, and then one, one more, since you being, the, uh, you being the Chicago Bears fan that you are, um, uh, another question. Do you think Cameron Meredith is a good pickup if – was in we went back. Oh, he was, no, he was basing this off of a, off an earlier question. If neither T.Y. Hilton or Ty Montgomery can play, is Cameron Meredith worth a pickup uh, this week? And that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, his, this guy's options that he has that he was looking at. I, th- I think definitely uh, the Bears wide receiver situation is a disaster. The Bears are a disaster as a franchise, except for the running back, Jordan Howard. That guy looks like the real deal. And if you want to talk about people who are going to be hyped going into next year, that's going to be the guy, which probably means it's the kiss of death. So now's the time to play. And on the wide receiver side of the ball, uh, you know, you got, you got Alshon Jeffrey, who is a perennial injury issue. Um, and, and drop ball specialist, Eddie Royal, who's been banged up. Uh, you got nothing at tight end. Uh, I mean, realistically, Meredith is a solid, solid play, I think, going forward for the rest of the season. You know, even if you do have to rely on Jay Cutler as your quarterback, I mean, as much as I think Jay Cutler does not care at all about football or the Chicago Bears or pretty much anything else in life, I do think that he has a hidden desire to still be on an NFL uh, roster next year, and it's not going to be with the Bears. So his last few games, by the grace of God, uh, Brian Hoyer broke his arm, and we were all sad. But this gives Jay Cutler the reason to believe that he has a chance for these next few games to play well enough to continue his career going forward. And if he is going to do that, Cameron Meredith is probably going to be the primary beneficiary of that happening. All righty. Um, well, I think that's about all that we have for tonight. Um, we are, I mean, we touched on the kind of the, the New Orleans running back situation at this point. I'm, I'm with you. I think Hightower, they've said that they're going to kind of go by a committee, so they're not going to commit to Ingram. Ingram can't seem to hold on to the ball. Um, Hightower, you know, Hightower proved last year over the last four games of the season, he actually saved a couple of my teams last year um, with his production down down the road. So, you know, no one, you know, I've, I think he's actually still available in a couple of my leagues, which I'm going to have to go and pick him up um, due to some injury issues I'm still dealing with. But I think Hightower could have a really good game. I think he would be worth a start. Again, because we're talking about, you know, they're going up against the non-existent run defense of the San Francisco 49ers. So, Yeah, I, I think absolutely. That's a, that's a solid play, I think, you know, with Hightower. I think going just, you know, down the stretch. I mean, Ingram has been – he's had his moments uh, in his career, but he's been, you know, I think fairly inconsistent. You know, he, he certainly doesn't have a lock on that job long term. Um, and maybe this is the type of game against a Wolf will absolutely – appallingly bad San Francisco defense that one of these guys is going to separate themselves. And if I had a bet who would separate themselves and maybe get some more carries going forward, I would think it might be high time. All right. Okay. So I think at that point with that, I think we'll go ahead and call it a a show. Um, 
I want to thank you, Greg, for for hopping on here and being willing to uh, to co-host with me. It's it's been a lot of fun. So I had a great time. Uh, this was a, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I think we covered a lot of a lot of great material, and I think certainly everything um, that the Skull King does and that you do for um, for, for DFS and it, this is it's a fantastic uh, show, and I'm, I'm glad to be on it. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, again, this has been the uh, Skull King Fantasy Football Podcast. Um, my name is Ryan Skullrude. Justin will be back with me next week. Um, we want to wish you guys all uh, good luck uh, on your uh, on your uh, your weeks this week, whether it be on your DFS lineups or your season long leagues. Uh, we hope that this information has been helpful. Be sure to uh, check out uh, SkullKingFootball.com tonight or today and throughout the next couple days. Um, to, to get uh, your projections and your uh, rankings for uh, all the players uh, and positions over these next couple days. So, uh, again, thank you for listening, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys next week.